Today's grand rounds will feature two presentations um, by our PMRF learners, um, vaccine confidence and uh, vaccine a, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in a local public health district in Georgia. They'll be presented by uh, Aaron Blau and David Jackson, both uh, from the Centers for Disease Control, Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship. The presentation will be approximately one hour and 30 minutes for questions and answer uh, afterward, after the presentation. Um, please welcome our first presenter, uh, Aaron Blau. Aaron, do you wanna start? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Erin Blau. I am a nurse officer in the United States Public Health Service and Preventive Medicine Fellow at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I previously deployed to the Vaccine Task Force within the CDC COVID-19 response and served as the clinical lead for the Vaccine Confidence Team. Today, I will be discussing COVID-19 vaccine confidence among healthcare personnel. First, I have no conflicts to disclose and this presentation reflects my opinion and not necessarily the official position of the CDC. All right, so today I'm gonna to cover the, and review the elements of vaccine confidence, define what it is, as well as the important role that healthcare personnel play in not only increasing vaccine confidence among the healthcare workforce, but also how healthcare personnel can increase vaccine confidence among the general public. I'll also share some recent survey polls and studies among healthcare personnel to better understand what vaccine confidence looks like. And finally, I'll review strategies for building vaccine confidence. Okay, so let's get started with defining vaccine confidence. So we can address vaccine hesitancy by building vaccine confidence, which is a multifaceted concept based largely on trust. It includes the trust that people have in recommended vaccines, providers who administer those vaccines, and the processes and policies that lead to vaccine development, licensure, manufacturing, and recommendations for use. A person must have trust in all three of these to feel fully confident in their decision to get vaccinated. This foundation is critical and can take time to build. Healthcare personnel's impact is often centered around helping patients trust in vaccine administrators, but healthcare personnel can also help build trust in the processes and policies by helping patients to understand new vaccine technologies, what to expect in terms of vaccine side effects, and how these vaccines are being continuously monitored for safety. And I'll be honest, I'm a nurse myself and I've administered hundreds if not thousands of vaccines prior to the pandemic. And there's a lot of information that's new. Um, I've never had to explain to a patient or a coworker what an EUA is or what an mRNA vaccine is. And so there's a lot of information to take in as a healthcare personnel, but also to be able to relay that to patients and coworkers. And so another really key aspect to building confidence is being honest and transparent about what is not known as well as what is known. And that can be really important for building trust. So willingness to accept a vaccine falls along a continuum. On the far left, you'll see refusal. On the far right, you'll see demand. And in between, we have passive acceptance. The vaccine demand continuum illustrates behaviors, whereas confidence is both a feeling and can be acted on. Some people might fall in the middle of the spectrum, adopting a wait and see approach. We want to move people towards that right side. The closer you get to active demand on the right side of the continuum, the increase in confidence the person likely feels in the vaccine, the vaccinator, and the health system, because they're actively choosing vaccination. If there is sufficient confidence and trust and ability, then people will seek out vaccines, overcoming barriers to do so. People with less confidence or motivation or ability may be less willing to overcome real or perceived barriers, such as transportation or getting time off work. Healthcare providers consistently rank as one of the most trusted sources for health information, and COVID-19 vaccines are no exception. This is supported by multiple data sources and illustrated here in data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. These data show that people who have not yet been vaccinated will likely turn to healthcare providers for information and guidance. And these findings extend across multiple racial and ethnic groups. Overall, 79% of surveyed adults will turn to a doctor, a nurse, or other healthcare provider, with slightly higher proportions of Black and Hispanic adults reporting 84% and 81% respectively. Healthcare personnel who trust and choose to receive a COVID-19 vaccine will make strong recommendations not just to their healthcare peers, but also to their patients and communities. And this will be key to building public trust. 
So understanding what vaccine confidence is and how healthcare personnel are trusted sources of information for vaccines, let's take a closer look at COVID-19 vaccine confidence being reported from healthcare personnel and then from the public. Um, first, let's clarify who we're actually talking about. So I've said healthcare personnel a number of times, but who are healthcare personnel and where do they actually work? When we talk about healthcare personnel, this includes all paid and unpaid persons serving in healthcare settings who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials. The composition of the healthcare workforce varies widely by setting as shown here. For example, nursing care facilities have a greater proportion of healthcare support staff than hospitals, and this includes nursing assistants, personal care aides, as well as non-clinical staff such as cooks and housekeepers. This includes persons who may not be directly involved in patient care, but potentially exposed to infectious agents while working in a healthcare setting. Thankfully, COVID-19 vaccine confidence is growing among healthcare personnel. The next few slides I'll show uh, represent recent findings from the Kaiser Family Foundation COVID-19 vaccine monitor surveys, which have been administered routinely over the last few months. Here you can see that in January, about one month after the authorization of both Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines, 58% of healthcare personnel indicated that they had already been vaccinated or were willing to get the vaccine as soon as they could. In February, just one month later, these numbers are already improving. Healthcare workers who reported that they were either vaccinated or planned to get it as soon as they can went up from 58% to 64%. We're also seeing the wait and group, the wait and see group decrease. In the previous slide, it was at 28%, and just one month later, it's at 14%. So COVID-19 vaccine confidence is increasing overall among healthcare personnel, but we know not all healthcare personnel are the same. So is it doing so disproportionately based on role and setting? In early March, a national survey of frontline healthcare workers found that just over half say they've received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, leaving about 48% who have not. Most who work in hospitals and outpatient clinics say they have received a COVID-19 vaccine, compared to just half who work in doctor's offices or in nursing homes or assisted care facilities, and only a quarter of those who work in home health care. Similarly, seven in 10 of those responsible for patient diagnosis and treatment, like a doctor or a nurse, report receiving a COVID-19 vaccine, compared to about four in 10 of those who perform administrative duties or who assist with patient care, such as bathing, eating, cleaning, exercising, and housekeeping. These differences in vaccine intention by healthcare role and setting are extremely important to understand as we seek to build confidence across the workforce and we seek to do so intersectionally. Overall, 40% of healthcare workers identify as people of color, including 16% who identify as Black and 13% who identify as Hispanic. Black and Hispanic healthcare workers made up larger shares of healthcare workers in home healthcare, and Black healthcare workers accounted for over a quarter of workers in skilled nursing facilities or other residential settings. This is also true for healthcare role. The racial and ethnic distribution of healthcare workers also varies by occupation or role, with Black and Hispanic healthcare workers making up relatively larger shares of AIDS, personal care workers, and direct contact support workers, while accounting for fewer healthcare providers, which would include staff like physicians, nurses, and pharmacists. Data from a recent study published in MMWR showed that even without obvious access issues, vaccine uptake remains low among healthcare personnel in long-term care settings. These two graphs here show the percentages of residents on the left and staff on the right vaccinated in skilled nursing facilities participating in the Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Program. Among over 11,000 facilities with available resident census data, the median estimated percentage of residents vaccinated was 77.8%, again shown on the left. However, among 11,000 facilities with available staff payroll data, the median estimated percentage of staff members vaccinated was 37.5%, shown on the right. The American Nursing Foundation conducted a survey in October of 2020 again before any vaccines were authorized or available. The survey showed that while over half of nurses were confident in the safety and efficacy of a hypothetical COVID-19 vaccine at the time, only about a third would voluntarily receive it. 
and slightly more than half reported they would feel comfortable discussing it with patients. Some vaccine hesitancy among providers may also be due to cultural or religious beliefs. When looking at this data among minority populations who responded to this nursing survey, about 51% were somewhat or very confident that the vaccine will be safe and effective. However, only 22% said that they would voluntarily receive it. The survey was repeated again in February of this year and showed 70% of respondents had received at least one dose of a two-dose COVID-19 vaccine. Of the unvaccinated respondents, over half either remain undecided or did not intend to get a vaccine. The reality is, is that while we're seeing overall increases in vaccine confidence among healthcare personnel, we're also unfortunately continuing to see reports of vaccine hesitancy, as shown here in some recent news headlines. It's important to also recognize the role the news plays in the public's perception of COVID-19 vaccines. And with continued headlines focusing on mistrust or hesitancy among the healthcare workforce, this certainly does have the power to impact the public's view of COVID-19 vaccines as well. Thankfully, we are also seeing growing confidence among the public. Recent data show promising gains in vaccine confidence and acceptance. A higher percentage of respondents in March reported acceptance or a willingness to accept the vaccine as soon as possible when compared to previous months. Interestingly, the percentage of people in the only if required or definitely not group has remained the same over time. We are also seeing the percentage of people in this wait and see group decrease over time over this last four months shown here. These promising trends are also seen when data are stratified across racial and ethnic groups. While we know confidence is increasing among healthcare personnel and the public, we also know hesitancy persists and it's important to better understand the reasons why some may be declining COVID-19 vaccines or choosing to wait to be vaccinated. You'll notice that across all groups, which includes this wait and see group, the group that will only get the vaccine if it's required and the group that reported they will definitely not receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Experiencing serious side effects was the top concern. Understanding these reasons for wanting to adapt a wait and see approach or only wanting to get the vaccine if it's required is crucial to building vaccine confidence and engaging in effective conversations around COVID-19 vaccines. So let's discuss some specific strategies and concrete examples for building confidence among healthcare personnel, as well as how healthcare personnel can be building confidence with patients and with the public. And I, I wanna just state before I jump into the next few slides, they're certainly geared towards a healthcare audience, um, but these strategies can be applied and tailored to a number of different situations. So keep that in mind as we go through some of these communication recommendations that they can be easily adapted um, to whatever scenario you may encounter. So this slide actually shows CDC's Vaccinate with Confidence strategy, which aims to build confidence in COVID-19 vaccines, the professionals who vaccinate, and the vaccination system. It's not a communication campaign, but rather a framework for thinking about interventions to increase vaccine confidence. There are three components to this framework. The first involves building trust, the second aims to empower healthcare personnel by helping them to feel confident in their own decision to get vaccinated and to recommend vaccination to their patients. This is the element I'll be focusing on for a lot of the, the remaining slides. And the third focuses on community engagement. To empower healthcare personnel, we are engaging with local and national professional associations, health systems, and healthcare personnel often and early to ensure a clear understanding of the vaccine development and approval process, new vaccine technologies, and the benefits of vaccination. Ensuring healthcare systems and medical practices are equipped to create culture that builds confidence in COVID-19 vaccines, and strengthening the capacity of healthcare prof professionals to have empathetic vaccine conversations, address myths and common questions, provide tailored vaccine information to patients, and use motivational interviewing techniques when needed. As clinical leaders and public health professionals, you all have an important role to play in these three areas. As a trusted messenger, remember that vaccine confidence begins with you. It's important to get a COVID-19 vaccine if you haven't already done so, 
The example you model in choosing to receive the vaccine is critical, as is your willingness to share and celebrate that experience. The importance of your role cannot be overemphasized. The idea of building COVID-19 vaccine confidence may seem daunting, especially in a busy healthcare setting, um, but there are some concrete steps you can be taking, such as hosting discussions where personnel at different levels within an agency can ask questions and share concerns in a safe and judgment-free space, sharing key messages with staff through emails, break room posters, or other channels that might be helpful for your setting, highlighting success stories of employees who were initially hesitant to get vaccinated, but who later made the decision to receive a COVID-19 vaccine allow them to share their reasons for getting vaccinated and what information they found to be most helpful in making that decision. And encourage trusted senior leaders to be vaccine champions. Other strategies include celebrating the decision to get vaccinated by making it visible, engaging in empathetic conversations, focusing on building trust and confidence when addressing misinformation, and in addition to larger campaigns, it still remains critical to focus on creating opportunities for authentic one-on-one -on -one conversations with trusted messengers where people can share their concerns and have their questions answered. Key messages to share through emails, break room posters, or other channels, as I mentioned before, can include things like the best COVID-19 vaccine is the first vaccine that's available to you. I do want to pause here and just point out that effective April 23rd, CDC and the FDA recommended the use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine to resume in the US. However, women younger than 50 years old should be made aware of a rare risk of blood clots with low platelets following vaccination and the availability of other COVID-19 vaccines where this risk has not yet been observed. That getting vaccinated is part of a larger team effort for their healthcare facility, that getting a COVID-19 vaccine adds a layer of protection against COVID-19 and could also protect your colleagues or your patients, and that vaccinations are recommended even if someone has previously had COVID. A theme that we've actually heard in many of our listening sessions is that many staff feel compelled to accept the vaccination as something that they can do to protect their patients. And as with most things in the healthcare space, preparation is key. This slide includes some important considerations when preparing for COVID-19 vaccine conversations. So like I've said before, vaccine confidence starts with you. Patients will likely ask you if you've been vaccinated yourself, and if you have not, they might ask why. Your response might have an impact on their own decision-making and whether they accept a COVID-19 vaccine. And this is really critical when we think about the role healthcare personnel play in this, um, especially. It's not just the healthcare provider that's in the exam room that's going to be conducting the visit that day. It could be the individual they meet at the front counter who checks them in, or the person that takes their vital signs or draws their blood or walks them to that exam room. Everyone plays a key role in interacting with that patient and increasing vaccine confidence. It's also important to start vaccine conversations early. Remind them when they have the vaccine, when the vaccine will be available to them specifically, and ask what they've heard from friends, family, or the media. Use this as an opportunity to debunk any myths or misconceptions. Learn how to engage in effective conversations and be prepared for questions. When discussing COVID-19 vaccines, it's important to remember that brief and consistent messaging is key. We're all getting a lot of information from a lot of places, and for some people, this information is very confusing. Um, I think for most people, it's very confusing. And so keeping messaging brief and consistent is very important. This slide includes some strategic messaging that you can use to discuss vaccines with your patients, even when time is limited. Many of these messages address some of the major concerns or questions that patients may have, including reiterating that vaccines are safe and effective, they are offered at no cost, and that there is a possibility they will experience some side effects. When having these conversations, there are important evidence-based strategies you can use to make them more effective. So this is all about interpersonal communication. Start from a place of empathy and understanding. The pandemic has been incredibly stressful for many people, if not everyone. Um, the first step is to acknowledge the disruption COVID-19 has caused in all of our lives, all in very different ways. Some of us may have lost loved ones or jobs or a sense of normalcy and security. Additionally, hesitancy may stem from feelings of mistrust in the medical establishment 
or the government as a result of mistreatment and collective or individual traumas. These are very real concerns for many, and listening with empathy and validating these concerns may help to make patients feel trust in you and the message you're delivering. It's important to assume patients will want to be vaccinated, but still be prepared for questions, including questions about common side effects. Remember to also give a clear and strong recommendation and include any relevant reason why vaccination might be particularly important for a specific patient, for example, because of their possible exposure at work or because of a potential underlying health condition. After your recommendation, let your patients know that you are available to share key facts, listen to their questions, and provide them additional information if it's requested. Use the conversation as a chance to address misinformation by sharing key facts. Ask what patients have heard from friends and family or on social media. Let them know it's easy to be confused by all the information that's circulating, some of which can be very conflicting and some of this information can be packaged in a way that makes it look so official or trustworthy. And that can be really hard to navigate. CDC has facts and messaging to counteract these common myths. And some of these key messages are actually shared here on the slide. It's important to remember that when addressing misinformation, the focus should remain on building confidence. Help navigate to accurate resources, including patient-focused material from your own trusted sources of information on COVID-19 vaccines. Some language you could use might be, I trust this website for accurate medical information. They also have great resources for patients that can be found here. When addressing misinformation from a person's community or family, focus less on the source of that information and more on the information itself. If a person's family member gave them incorrect information, you can counter by saying, I'm sure when your brother gave you that information, it was with good intentions for you, but the information isn't correct. Here's some information that's accurate on the same question I've shared with many other people who have the same concern. It's also important to build on trust that might already be earned through a patient-provider relationship. Some language to emphasize could be, my priority for you has always been and will continue to be your health and wellness. I know there is a huge amount of information out there about these vaccines. Just as with everything I recommend to keep you healthy, you can trust I strongly recommend these COVID-19 vaccines to help protect you from getting sick. And finally, build trust Build a trusted space by seeking permission to share your knowledge with them. Returning to the family member example, use language like, your brother gave you a lot of information and I appreciate you bringing that in and sharing it with me. I have some information that I think will help address your question. May I share it with you? When considering strategies for building confidence, we must be sensitive to the long-standing health and social inequities faced by racial and ethnic minority groups and other groups experiencing health disparities. Many people from these groups may also have a mistrust or fear in healthcare institutions or government after experiencing very real trauma or mistreatment from these institutions. It is important to show compassion and empathy in this space. Messaging should be tailored and culturally appropriate for the populations working within your facility. Establish partnerships with community groups, faith-based organizations, and leaders who serve and are representative of the patients you see. Leverage those partnerships to develop effective messages around vaccine confidence. And avoid stigmatizing language. Ensure you and your staff are trained to identify and interrupt all forms of discrimination. Once you've answered questions and explained side effects, encourage patients to take at least one action. If they received the vaccine that day, it could be scheduling the second dose appointment right away, or encourage them to share their experience with others if they received the vaccine. If they decline vaccination, ask them to read additional information you provided them on COVID-19 vaccines. And if they decline, continue to remind them about the importance of getting a COVID-19 vaccine during future routine visits and wrap up the conversation by letting them know that you are open and available for discussion or answering any, answering any additional questions they may have. Ultimately, the decision is theirs, and it's important that we provide all the information necessary for them to feel empowered to make that decision, that informed decision. So as the COVID-19 landscape changes rapidly, it's important to seek information from trusted sources that are constantly and consistently updated. So 
Um, these are some key resources that I find very helpful to recommend to others as well. You can find more information within this list of resources that CDC has actually created to help healthcare professionals with COVID-19 vaccine conversations. And finally, I wanna highlight some publicly available resources on the CDC website. So we have a communications toolkit specific to healthcare systems, but it also exists, as I mentioned, you know, this is specific to healthcare, but we have resources that exist and are tailored to essential workers, correctional facilities, long-term care facilities, and they're all located in the same area. So I highly encourage you to, um, to check them out if it would be helpful for your particular situation. Um, specific to healthcare, we've developed and continue to refine tools and resources and ready-made materials to provide key information on COVID-19 vaccines through what healthcare personnel need to know slide decks, fact sheets, frequently asked questions to dispel myths, social media posts and stickers to help amplify healthcare personnel's positive experiences when choosing to receive a vaccine. Medical centers, clinics, pharmacies, and clinicians can use or adapt these ready-made materials to build confidence about COVID-19 vaccinations among their healthcare teams and their staff. And lastly, I'd just like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge the tireless work of our healthcare personnel and public health professionals, recognizing that many of you may be in the audience today. Um, for the last 15, nearly 16 months, um, you all have been and will continue to be on the front line for the nation's fight against COVID-19 by providing critical care to those who are or might be infected with SARS-CoV-2. Healthcare personnel risk their health and safety each and every day. Um, to protect healthcare personnel and long-term care facility staff and residents who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 illness, authorized COVID-19 vaccines were first made available and should continue to be made available to healthcare personnel and long-term care settings. Recognizing the size of the healthcare workforce with over 21 million individuals, um, their high risk for exposure and severe illness, and understanding the influence healthcare providers have on the public's confidence in COVID-19 vaccines, makes it essential that we invest in building vaccine confidence to protect the healthcare personnel, disproportionately affected communities, and the greater American public. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, uh, Aaron. This presentation is now open for questions. You can use the Q&A box um, and we'll uh, address the questions as time permits. Um, so some questions have already appeared um, for you um, already, um, uh, in addition to some comments about the great presentation. Um, so the first question that, that popped in was, uh, they would like to hear the effect of the pause on the Janssen vaccine on uh, vaccine hesitancy. So what's been the, uh, the effect of the pause um, on vaccine hesitancy? That is a really good question, and I think that's something that we will continue to kind of see in the next month or so, because there is a bit of a delay as we see these survey findings and polls, national polls, especially in representation. Um, I think initially there was quite a bit of concern about hesitancy surrounding or even um, individuals preferring one vaccine over another and fearful of side effects certainly could contribute. Um, but I do not think it's affected uh, confidence um, overall. Uh, we haven't seen, at least er this early, we have not seen um, any issues in overall vaccine confidence in all three. Um, we have two questions um, that basically ask the same thing, and it gets to uh, social media and misinformation. Um, so what is the role of online misinformation in vaccine hesitancy, and what are some of the best ways to address online misinformation? Yeah, so this is uh, this is a really interesting topic, and it's not one I think um, we fully appreciated before the pandemic. I don't think it's something that necessarily existed in the vaccine space, at least domestically, um, before the pandemic. So this misinformation, and and it's not just specific to vaccines. It it, it exists um, for a lot of the COVID nineteen response and pandemic, and a lot of information related to testing and illness. Um, but it, it certainly plays a large role in um, delivery of information and uh, whether that information is accurate and reliable. And so, you know, to the, the to the second part of that question, you know, 
First, it's very difficult. Um, and we're constantly trying to monitor what misinformation is being put, in out, being put out there by engaging with partners and listening to what they're saying um, and what they're hearing and what people are concerned about. So when I talk about like have you know, discussions with your staff and, and with patients about what they're concerned about, this is a key time to hear about that misinformation and, and you know, because we can't always know what's being spread. Um, but it's really important to know these fears and these things that are being spread on so social media, especially. And then to combat it, you know, knowing what's being spread and being able to offer accurate information instead of it. Um, I think the other thing that we need to consistently be doing is making sure that we identify where trusted information can be found regularly. So some of those slides I pulled up at the end making sure we bring people back to those sources of information and that they're looking to their health department or their healthcare facility for that information. So um, next question, your presentation indicates vaccine confidence is going up. However, recent media reports have indicated herd immunity is no longer within grasp because of uh, so many people are hesitant. So has hesitancy gone up since the latest data? Um, and do you agree that herd immunity is possibly no longer a realistic goal? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think this speaks to uh, one of the things I mentioned during the presentation that the news headlines and the media play a tremendous role in our perception of what confidence looks like and herd immunity and um, if people are even accepting the vaccine. And so um, I can't speak to um, how it affects herd immunity. I haven't seen that headline, but um, I would say that this is just a, a really great point to make in the sense that uh, that the way things are portrayed in media has uh, can certainly impact the way people perceive the vaccines being distributed. Um, how do you approach vaccine hesitancy due to fear of side effects compared to broader fear of vaccines given greater legitimacy around milder side effects, such as fever, fatigue, aches, et cetera? And so I think if I'm understanding the question, how do we message or communicate more serious side effects related to the COVID-19 vaccines versus more mild side effects? Is that okay? Yeah. So I think, and you know, this is really where you have to tailor messaging to who you're speaking with. Um, if it's an audience that is looking for hard numbers and wants to see the data and wants to see the, the one in seven million people who may experience, you know, X, Y, Z, then that might be the best approach for being able to explain how rare um, a more serious side effect is. I think when talking about the vaccines, especially in this you know, in the scenario of a pandemic response, being able to weigh the benefits of receiving the COVID-19 and the consequences of potential health sequelae related to becoming ill with COVID-19 is also important to bring into the discussion. Kind of the next question actually was address the, uh, the COVID symptoms versus getting the vaccine, but you uh, kind of addressed that. Um, what are the best strategies for addressing the definitely not group? That number doesn't seem to move much. Yeah, this is a really good question. And, you know, I think it speaks back to ultimately it is someone's individual decision on whether they want to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And that definitely not group it's, it's difficult because if they feel strongly about not receiving it for whatever reason, I think what our, what role we have is trying to understand what those reasons may be. Um, sometimes you see these polls and the wait and see group or the probably not or the definitely not group. Some of their reasons for not wanting the vaccine are reasons that we can very quickly dispel. So, uh, you know, I've seen polls, especially early on in the, the, the vaccine rollout that said they were worried about cost and they were worried about accessing it. And these are things that we can very quickly address. Um, now, as you get, as you move from that wait and see to that probably not to that definitely not group, that's when you start to get individuals who just, it, they have no interest in receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think what I'd say to that is to continue to provide accurate information and always leave the door open for conversation when they have questions, if they have questions, and but to really be focusing on those individuals who may be more, um, you know, that we sometimes call it like a movable middle, may be more interested or more open to hearing new information because they just haven't quite made up their mind. 
the next question talks about um, looking at the stratifying the types of healthcare providers. So is there any difference um, that is known in the rates of vaccination or intention to not vaccinate among um, healthcare providers who diagnose, such as physicians and nurses, and then other allied healthcare professionals who assist patients, but are also crucially involved with direct patient care? Yeah, so this is, you know, something that's of great interest to me, um, because I really tried to focus on healthcare personnel, and um, it depends on what you see out there. I, from my experience, Kaiser Family Foundation conducts this survey routinely. Um, we've been seeing it come since, I think, November of last year, and as part of that survey, they do identify healthcare workers. Now, the nice thing about that is it, it's a more encompassing term. And so we get to see kind of the, the broad stretch of healthcare workers and not just healthcare providers, which can sometimes just be defined as, um, like was mentioned, like diagnosing and treating providers. Um, but when we get down to the specific types of professional groups within the healthcare workforce, we are seeing non-physician groups less likely to accept COVID-19 vaccines or report lower uptake rates of COVID-19. And I say uptake because uptake is the result of access and confidence. And so someone may be confident in, in the COVID-19 vaccines, but not yet given access to them. Likewise, someone might have access to COVID-19 vaccines, but not feel comfortable getting them or confident getting them. And so those two need to exist in order to result in uptake. And so just thinking about the vaccine rollout and how it was first made available to healthcare professionals, we know that not all healthcare professionals receive the same type of access to the vaccine. So I think it's important to recognize where it was first made available within the healthcare workforce. So acute care hospitals, long-term care facilities were some of the first areas it was provided. And those you know, non-physician workers may be more likely to have access and confidence in it. Whereas some of the settings where I don't think access might've been as um, widely available, um, we're also seeing low confidence. So this is a very long way of saying that we are definitely seeing differences in our non-physician, non-treating provider uh, healthcare worker populations, um, especially when we uh, look um, to certified nursing assistants, MAs, and other staff. Any sense of a difference in vaccine hesitancy among rural versus urban uh, healthcare workers? Yeah, so this is something that's uh, very interesting. Um, I will say again, Kaiser Family Foundation does uh, provide a little bit, you can uh, stratify some of their more recent polls to see, and this can be, be a little enlightening to that, you know, rural versus urban. Um, I, we've also seen it in some of our healthcare data related to setting. So we'll find some of the larger acute care hospitals maybe reporting higher rates of uptake or higher vaccination rates among their staff versus some of the lower, the smaller community-based hospitals. Have vaccine incentives been shown to deter vaccine hesitancy? I was waiting for this question. So vaccine incentives are really interesting. Um, and when used appropriately, they can be effective. And so what I would say is that um, we recommend supportive policies as incentives. So supportive things like um, taking, you know, offering time off for staff so that they can travel to get the vaccine. If, if you're not offering it on site, um, offering it on site to your employees so they don't have to travel to get it. Um, offering time off so if they experience symptoms after the vaccine, they're able to stay home. Um, offering transportation, things, those types of supportive policies can be incentivizing to staff who aren't quite sure if they want to get the vaccine or don't quite feel comfortable. Um, but that there can be unintended consequences to larger monetary incentives, um, especially when we talk about like lower income workers, um, or when we talk about the differences in treatment between workers who maybe are uh, choosing not to receive the vaccine for a religious or cultural exemption. Um, could, do you have any recommendations on how to talk to individuals who have already had a COVID-19 diagnosis and now do not believe that they need a vaccine? Yeah, so th this there's a lot of really great messaging and um, kind of conversation framing about this um, online that I'm happy to provide res resources to as well, because this question comes up a lot is that individuals who have acquired natural immunity from, um, you know, it, becoming ill with COVID-19, 
um, and now they have natural immunity, do not feel like they need to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. And so the messaging around that is that it is still important that they receive a vaccine. Because this is so new to everyone, we don't know how much protection natural immunity can offer, um, but we do know that a vaccine could still be effective and it is still recommended for those who have a history of COVID-19 illness. Um, do you have any suggestions for discussion about uh, vaccine hesitancy in pregnant persons? Um, is there a, a, a difference um, with pregnant persons and vaccine hesitancy? Yeah, so this was a really, you know, this continues to be an ongoing discussion. And, um, and this is one actually that comes up a lot uh, in the nursing workforce. It's a predominantly female profession. And one of the common things we heard from nursing professional associations was we're, we're, we have a lot of nurses who are concerned about if they're breastfeeding or if they're pregnant, if they should get the vaccine. And so thankfully, there's a lot of information available that you know talks about the risks about um, if you were to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, they're still recommended in women who are breastfeeding or who plan to become pregnant or who are pregnant. But you know, going back to the, the trusted messenger and trusted source of information for individuals who do have questions about that, going to their trusted source of information, their healthcare provider, their OBGYN is, is what I would recommend in, in having that discussion as they'll be, you know, most best versed to be able to discuss their health, their baby's health and making the best decision for them. Uh, do you think a vaccine passport would have a net positive or net negative impact on public perception of the vaccine itself? A vaccine passport. So that's an interesting concept. And, and so when you say vaccine passport, you mean like in order to enter certain countries or places to, to present your, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know that I have uh, an opinion on this, uh, but just thinking of other uh, conditions, you know, it's not uncommon when we travel to other countries to have to show uh, vaccination status for other types of illnesses. Um, and so it, it, I think there's, it's part of a multi, multifaceted approach to control the pandemic and also taking into consideration, you know, what other countries are expecting as far as quarantining and testing when um, coming to a country or leaving a country. And uh, due to time, we'll make this the last question. Um, and uh, but we've uh, received more questions than there is time uh, for your presentation. So our final question um, is uh, from our colleague uh, Melissa Reyes, an FDA. Do you think vaccine status changed from emergency use authorization? If, if uh, vaccine status changed from emergency use authorization to an FDA-approved vaccine? Will change vaccine? Will that change vaccine hesitancy? In other words, the type of category that it's in with the FDA approvals, the emergency use versus the other pathways. This is actually, you know, quite an interesting thing, and I could I could ramble on about this for a while, but it is quite interesting because for a lot of people they had never heard the term EUA, and that scared them. Um, and so we did a lot of messaging about what EUAs even were. Um, and having to, to clarify they're authorized and that this is actually a common mechanism for authorizing very, very important drugs, medications, vaccines in emergency situations. And, and you know, reminding people that we did this for Zika and for Ebola and you know, for many other situations. And so there was a lot of messaging and needing to, to help people understand what an EUA was, but still that confused people. And in addition to that, one of the common things we've heard is that people feel like there's just not enough information on these vaccines. And so I, I do feel like once the vaccines would reach um, approval status, that may be, uh, you know, the information that someone needs to make their decision that, that there is enough evidence in order for the FDA to approve a vaccine and that they feel more comfortable because they're, they're more comfortable with that term from previous vaccines that they've received. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for the, all your presentations and Q&A, um, and uh, we, will, uh, we do get to collect all of the, the questions, um, and our, our panelists and speakers will get to um, review them. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, David Jackson, um, who's with CDC, but assigned to the Cobb and Douglas County uh, Health Departments, um, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the COVID-19 rollout and uh, vaccine um, in the, that health department. Um, so David, I don't know if you, Aaron, you may need to stop sharing your screen and, um, 
Let's see if uh, David can get his slides up. Great, I can see them perfectly. So David, the floor is yours You'll, um, for your presentation on COVID-19 vaccination, the Cobb and Douglas uh, health, to health public health experience. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much and good afternoon, everybody. I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, chat with you all and um, really want to uh, look forward to the, the chance to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine rollout experience here at Cobb and Douglas Public Health, where I'm assigned as a uh, preventive medicine resident. Hopefully, um, this presentation will add to the information that Dr. Romachevsky presented in last month's preventive medicine grand rounds. And if you missed her presentation about Denton County Public Health's very impressive vaccination hub, I would definitely encourage you to watch the recorded lecture on CDC train. I'd like to frame our discussion today using a public health preparedness and response model described in this 2005 workshop summary on public health risks of disasters from the National Research Council. The model was first presented in 2004 by Jonathan Burstein and defines the resources necessary to respond to disasters in terms of systems, supplies, staff, and space. At Cobb and Douglas Public Health, we have certainly experienced challenges in all of these areas during the vaccine rollout thus far. However, by working together as a team and collaborating with our partners, we have overcome many obstacles. Over the next few slides, I will share more about these experiences. But before we discuss our COVID-19 vaccine rollout efforts, I wanted to begin with a quick background about Cobb and Douglas Public Health and the counties the agency serves. As indicated by this state and local health department governance classification map available from CDC, Georgia is considered to have a shared governance health structure with one or in some cases, several state employees in key leadership positions within local public health districts. Delivery of public health services in Georgia's 159 counties is accomplished through a total of 18 such local public health districts. Districts vary in the number of counties they support, ranging from one to 16 based on population. Cobb and Douglas Public Health serves Georgia Public Health District 3-1, which includes Cobb and Douglas counties, and is located just northwest of the city of Atlanta. According to US Census Bureau population estimates, 760,141 individuals resided in Cobb County and 146,343 individuals resided in Douglas County in 2019. Although Cobb and Douglas Public Health is a separate legal entity from the State Department of Public Health and Cobb and Douglas counties, the agency is led by a state employed district health director and is governed by two separate boards of health representing Cobb and Douglas counties. This allows the health district to share a common chief executive officer and a central administrative staff while also granting each board of health the authority to develop rules specific to the unique needs of its population. This slide provides a little more background on the population growth in both counties in recent years using US Census Bureau population estimates obtained from the Georgia Department of Public Health's online analytical statistical information system. The population of both counties increased by a little over 5% over the five year period of 2013 to 2017 shown in the bar charts on the slide. As you can see from the pie chart showing the county populations by race in 2017, the racial makeup is different between the counties with the white population accounting for 63% and the black population accounting for just over 28% of the overall population in Cobb County, while around 48% of Douglas County residents are white and 47% are black. Of note, racial diversity has increased particularly in Cobb County over the period of 2013 to 2017, with the black population increasing by around 12% and the Asian population increasing by around 17%. This infographic shows Cobb and Douglas Public Health's mission, vision, and values. As you can see from the mission statement, working with partners has long been a critically important component of the agency's mission to promote, promote and protect the health and safety of those living in Cobb and Douglas counties. Cobb and Douglas Public Health has built a wealth of partnerships over the years, but never have we appreciated these partners more than during this pandemic. In terms of systems, the process of becoming an authorized COVID-19 vaccine provider in Georgia begins with enrollment via the Georgia Registry of Immunization Transactions and Services, or GRIT system. In addition to enrolling as a vaccine provider ourselves, one of our biggest roles early on was helping other providers troubleshoot challenges with completing the vaccine enrollment process to ensure that as many providers as possible were authorized to provide vaccines as soon as they became available. Once a vaccine provider completes their enrollment and is approved, they, they can begin ordering vaccines. Orders are submitted through an online survey. A portion of the initial screen for this survey is shown on this slide. With vaccine demand initially far outpacing vaccine supply and new providers being authorized each week, 
It was a challenge not knowing how many vaccine doses we might receive from a given order. Early on, we were only receiving a fraction of the doses we ordered with supply chain difficulties or even large weather events having significant impacts on the amount of vaccine we received. Given the uncertainty of vaccine supply, we began releasing appointments no more than five to seven days ahead of time. As a result, our leadership team has met almost daily for months to discuss vaccine inventory, upcoming orders and appointments, and strategies for addressing logistical challenges that arise. Since the beginning, these vaccine meetings have included updates on the progress of our efforts to address health equity and vaccine hesitancy concerns to ensure that all Cobb Douglas County residents have access to a vaccine and credible information about the vaccines from trusted sources. In recent weeks, vaccine demand has declined across the state of Georgia, including here in Cobb and Douglas counties. This changing demand emphasizes the importance of our continued efforts to look for new ways to improve vaccine access and uptake. Before we received our first shipment of vaccines, we began collecting information from healthcare personnel interested in vaccinations who were not already connected with another authorized vaccine provider. At the time we received our first shipment of vaccines, a new statewide appointment system distinct from the GRIT system was under development that would allow individuals interested in receiving a vaccine to search for vaccine appointments at local health department sites throughout the state. However, because the system was not yet ready, we needed to establish a temporary system to provide vaccine appointments until the statewide system became available. We sent an email to all of the healthcare personnel whose information we had collected. The email included a link to access the temporary appointment system shown on the right side of the slide, logistical information about vaccine appointments, and a link to the vaccine consent form. Because our vaccine supplies were limited and this temporary system was not able to screen out ineligible individuals, the email also included information about eligibility and requested that those receiving the appointment system link not forward it to others. Unfortunately, many forwarded the appointment system link to others anyway, often without including any of the additional information in the email in the forwarded message. In addition, our email to the healthcare personnel coincided with the announcement that vaccine eligibility would soon be expanded to include individuals 65 years of age and older and public safety personnel. This exacerbated the issues of the system's inability to screen out currently ineligible individuals and the forwarding of the appointment scheduling link. The result was that some folks who were not yet eligible for a vaccination were able to get an appointment and the scheduling system and our entire agency website crashed from the overwhelming amount of web traffic. With the system down, no one was able to schedule an appointment. This understandably resulted in a lot of frustration and anxiety in the community leading to an overwhelming increase in the call volume received by our very small agency call center. As a result, call center waiting times were extremely long, prompting many to explore other avenues for answers, such as emails, inquiries, or complaints to other county or go state government officials. Needless to say, the pressure on our staff to find a solution quickly was very high, not just because of the many vaccine related calls, but also to ensure that the needs of our clients related to core non-COVID related services, such as WIC and family planning were met. While we worked on solutions for our appointment system, getting our website up and running again and handling the huge volume of traffic to our website, we also pulled staff from other parts of the agency to shore up the call center and answer email inquiries coming through our general agency inboxes. We quickly learned that the majority of people were primarily interested in updated information about vaccines and vaccine appointments. So in addition to the steps we took to get our website back up and running and increase the capacity of our call center, we updated our website with information about COVID-19 vaccines and have continued to update our website as new information becomes available. The screenshot shown on the right side of the slide shows some of the information about COVID-19 vaccines that is currently available on our website. We also established a form where people could sign up to receive email updates related to vaccines and vaccine appointments. The form is shown on the right side of the slide. While interest in vaccine related updates has waned along with vaccine demand in recent weeks, nearly 41,000 individuals had signed up to receive email updates using this registration form as of the end of March. We also worked with partners to assist specific groups. One example was our partnership with senior services staff in both Cobb and Douglas counties to initially assist with calls from individuals 65 years of age and older who had challenges with accessing vaccine appointments. The county senior services staff members have also helped with identifying outreach locations in the community where we could better serve these older adults, making appointments for these folks at vaccine outreach events and, our, and at our mass vaccination sites, and identifying homebound individuals who are interested in receiving a COVID-19 vaccination. In order to address the limitations of our initial appointment system, we rapidly explored other options, settling on a system that was being used successfully by another health district in Georgia. 
We also moved our agency website to a different server that could support a much higher volume of traffic and added links for accessing vaccine appointments at other locations throughout the state. This is a screenshot of our website that shows how interested individuals could access vaccine appointments in Cobb and Douglas counties, as well as elsewhere in Georgia. Clicking on one of the yellow boxes would direct folks to our updated appointment system, while the links in the other vaccine providers and GEMA HS mass vaccination site sections would navigate to other sites where individuals could search for vaccine appointments at other locations throughout the state. The updated scheduling system looked like this. Among the many benefits of this particular appointment system was its flexibility, making the scheduling of appointments for vaccine outreach events much easier. However, I don't wanna give the false impression that rolling out this system went off without, without a hitch. When we first launched, a glitch in the system resulted in triple booked appointments for the first week, requiring us to scramble to get people contacted, canceled and reappointed because we simply didn't have the vaccine doses or the staff to handle the triple booked appointments. It took several weeks to work through the backlog of appointments that had to be canceled and rebooked, and our call center volume again surged due to the understandable community frustration and confusion. This issue was further compounded by delays and shipments of vaccine around this time due to severe weather across the country that required us to reschedule thousands of additional appointments because of lack of vaccines. Throughout this difficult time, our staff worked long hours and demonstrated amazing levels of patience, perseverance, and resilience. Ultimately, we were able to transition in March to the statewide appointment system managed by the Georgia Department of Public Health. This transition went relatively smoothly. Although no system is perfect, this system has helped address a number of issues, including easing entry of administered vaccine doses into the GRIT system. This slide shows a screenshot of the new vaccine appointment system's initial registration screen. As you saw in an earlier slide, we added links to other websites where individuals could search for vaccine appointments at locations throughout Georgia. It has been really encouraging to see both the number of authorized vaccine providers and the number of vaccine doses allocated to Georgia increasing steadily over the past few months. The Georgia Department of Public Health has supported us in so many ways, including through the resources available on their website, such as the Georgia Vaccine Locator shown on this slide. Clicking on the Search the Locator hyperlink shown in the red box on the slide navigates to the Find a COVID Vaccination Site webpage shown on this slide, where individuals can search by keyword to find convenient vaccine providers. As an example, the screenshot on the bottom of the slide shows the first two providers that come up when using the search term COB. In addition, individuals could search for available appointments through the health department, retail pharmacy, or other healthcare provider links shown in the screenshot on the left side of this slide, or via appointments at one of the Georgia Emergency Management Agency mass vaccination sites available throughout uh, through the website pictured on the right side of the slide. The final system related to vaccine appointments that I wanted to mention was one that we created to help ensure that no vaccine doses were wasted at the end of the day. Sign up for the so-called vaccine emergency list is available by clicking the vaccine emergency list hyperlink shown in the red box on the left side of the slide. Use of this hyperlink navigates to the registration form for the CDPH COVID vaccine emergency list shown on the right side of the slide, where individuals can enter their name and contact information. While this emergency list was very important when the vaccine demand far outpaced vaccine supply, the need for this list is essentially gone now that we are taking walk-ups and have a number of appointments that go unfilled each day. Once vaccinations are administered, they need to be documented in the GRIT system. You may remember that we discussed this system earlier when talking about enrollment as an authorized COVID-19 vaccine provider. Prior to the pandemic, vaccine providers had 30 business days to enter administered doses of vaccines into GRITs. However, the COVID-19 vaccine provider agreements require that all doses of vaccine administered in Georgia be entered into the GRIT system within 24 hours. Future vaccine shipments are also tied to the proportion of vaccine doses administered, with vaccine providers expected to administer 80% or more of the vaccine doses they receive within seven days of receipt, or else future vaccine shipments may be impacted. Because the GRIT system is utilized for this tracking, it is critically important for us to enter vaccine doses as quickly as possible after they are administered. Until we transition to the new statewide appointment system, which eases entry of administered vaccine doses into GRITs, it was a particularly heavy lift for our agency to enter thousands of administered vaccine doses into GRITs daily. Staff from all over the agency assisted with entering administered vaccine doses into GRITs, and we brought in staff from the county government and temporary staff to help with these entries as well in order to meet the increased demand. I also wanted to touch briefly on vaccine safety monitoring systems. We encourage everyone who gets a vaccine at one of our sites to sign up for CDC's Be Safe system to report any vaccine-related symptoms they experience after receiving a vaccine. 
We have also completed or assisted other providers across our district with completing many VAERS reports for reporting vaccine-related adverse events. We continue to emphasize the critical importance of these vaccine safety reporting systems to those who receive a vaccine at one of our sites and to other authorized providers in the district to help with ongoing vaccine safety monitoring. In addition to the systems already described, a number of policies, protocols, procedures, and trainings had to be updated or developed to standardize processes and ensure quality. We also had to work with the county emergency management infrastructure to establish appropriate channels for communication via radio at our mass vaccination sites and establish rules for appropriate staff communication over the radios, since this communication system is also used by other county emergency response groups. In addition, we had to establish multiple contracts with outside entities for a variety of reasons, whether those be contracts for assistance with vaccine administration, use of a particular site for mass vaccinations, or some other purpose. And lastly, I wanted to mention the assistance we received from Cobb County government to establish a much larger call center to address the ongoing high volume of vaccine related calls. This has been such a huge help allowing agency staff to return to their regular duties. Transitioning to supplies, the vaccines themselves are obviously the most critical supply, but anticipating that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine would be authorized, we purchased ultra cold freezers, one for Cobb County and the other for Douglas County. These photos show the freezer in a close-up of the temperature reading. The Pfizer vaccine needs to be stored at between minus 80 and minus 60 degrees Celsius. We had to ensure that we had a secure space for the freezers in an area with backup power supply via our generator and the proper temperature monitoring equipment for this type of freezer. In addition, we had to log and document freezer temperatures for a given period of time before we could become eligible to receive Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The photo on the left side of the slide shows the generator control panel and the photo on the right side shows the freezer temperature monitoring device. In terms of vaccines, we are currently administering all three authorized COVID-19 vaccines. We are now utilizing the Pfizer-BioNTech two-dose mRNA vaccine almost exclusively for our mass vaccination sites and reserving the single-dose Johnson & Johnson viral vector vaccine mostly for outreach and special events aimed at vaccinating harder to reach populations. Given the different handling and preparation requirements of the different vaccines, we try to avoid administering more than one type of vaccine at the same location at the same time whenever possible to reduce the risk of errors. Because of its special handling requirements, I wanted to provide a little more detail about the Pfizer vaccine. This infographic from Pfizer-BioNTech describes this, the contents of the softbox shippers that are used for maintaining the cold chain for this vaccine during the shipping process. This slide walks through the process of unpacking a softbox shipper starting in the top left corner of the slide and progressing via the arrows to the bottom left corner of the slide. You can see the temperature monitor in the second photo that confirms that no temperature excursions were experienced during shipping, followed by the dry ice pod on the upper right and then the box containing the trays of vaccine. The last photo on the bottom left side of the slide shows the vaccine trays in the ultra cold freezer. The ancillary supply kits ship separately and include all of the components shown on this slide. The ancillary supply kits usually arrive on the same day as the vaccine shipment. It's important to note that the ancillary supply kit for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine includes the diluent necessary for reconstituting a vaccine, as well as needles, syringes, alcohol prep pads, vaccination cards, a needle gauge and length chart, and some basic PPE such as surgical masks and a face shield. A variety of additional supplies are also needed for vaccine administration, whether it be personal protective equipment for our staff, additional syringes and needles, trays for holding drawn up vaccine, sharps containers, or other supplies. We also put together several medical jump bags and backpacks like this one to organize the medical equipment and supplies for post-vaccination monitoring and management of severe allergic reactions should they arise during the observation period. Having the equipment in backpacks like this one also facilitate transport of these materials to outreach events. Among other things, each backpack has a blood pressure cuff, stethoscope and pulse oximeter like those shown on the bottom left side of the slide, as well as an emergency medication kit like the one shown on the bottom right side of the slide that includes at least three epinephrine auto injectors and diphenhydramine. The backpacks also contain a bag valve mask, supplies for starting IVs including IV fluids, and additional first aid supplies should they be needed. We also have AEDs and portable oxygen tanks available with multiple types of oxygen delivery devices kept in the backpacks if needed as well. Because our mass vaccination sites are drive through operations, signs have been critical for guiding people through our operation. These are just a few examples of the many different signs we use at our mass vaccination sites. 
Cones and barricades have also been essential for guiding folks through our mass vaccination operations. To date, we have purchased 1,400 cones and 200 barricades and borrowed many more from the counties to support our operations. We've also purchased a number of capital items to support our operations, such as the truck shown on the left side of the slide for hauling equipment and supplies, command trailers like those shown in the middle of the slide, which are used by our command staff at our mass vaccination sites, storage trailers that allow us to securely store equipment and supplies at our mass vaccination sites, like those shown in the upper right corner of the slide, and tents like those shown on the right side of the slide. We also purchase these larger tents that can be heated or cooled. Inside these tents, our vaccinators draw up vaccines and keep vaccination supplies close at hand and administrative staff complete paperwork such as vaccine record cards. Each tent is placed between two lanes of our drive through operation such that two teams of vaccinators can operate out of a single tent. A variety of other supplies have been needed as well, including computers for managing the operation, tablets for scanning QR codes to check folks in prior to receiving their vaccinations, and multifunction print copy scan devices for addressing a variety of needs on site. We also have a variety of office supplies and cleaning supplies. And lastly, ensuring that our staff on site are fed and well hydrated is vitally important. Each day we provide lunch for the staff working at our mass vaccination sites so that they do not have to leave to pick up lunch or use the limited refrigerator space on site for their own lunches. We also received funding for the mobile public health van shown on this slide. The van will be used for a variety of public health out outreach activities, including vaccine outreach events. The critical funding for the equipment and supplies described here has come from a variety of sources, including federal support distributed to state and county governments to support COVID-19 response activities. Staffing has also been vital throughout the vaccination rollout. The categories shown on this slide are some of the many staffing roles we have needed to fill with either existing staff, new hires, temporary staffing, partners, or volunteers. We have experienced staffing shortages in nearly all of these areas and have often had to assign existing staff to new roles, requiring others to take on additional responsibilities while filling in for reassigned staff. Importantly, bringing on new staff, partner staff, or volunteers requires significant support from human resources to ensure the necessary paperwork, training, and other requirements are completed. We have also noted significant turnover in staff, which further increases the burden on human resources for onboarding new staff. For positions requiring particular skills, such as nursing roles, high demand across the region has further complicated filling these vacancies. Our Medical Reserve Corps coordinator has also played a critical role with onboarding volunteers to assist with our ongoing vaccination efforts. And as I noted earlier, many of our staff have really stepped up and taken on new responsibilities, demonstrating strong leadership skills and resilience in the face of these challenges, which has been truly inspiring. In terms of space, we are so grateful to Cobb County Parks, the Cobb County Government Department of Parks and Recreation for allowing us to use Jim R. Miller Park for the past year. This site first served as our mass testing venue in Cobb County and now serves a dual role with both mass testing and mass vaccination operations occurring here concurrently. This park is home to the annual North Georgia State Fair and typically holds other large events each year. The slide and roller coaster on the right side of the slide are always popular attractions during the fair. This location is well suited to serve as a drive through mass vaccination site. It's about a mile away from our main health department location in Marietta, Georgia, facilitating transfer of supplies and offering readily available staff support when needed. It's also centrally located within Cobb County, making it widely accessible to county residents. The main gate utilized for accessing our vaccination operation is located on a road that generally has little to no traffic, and the site has a very large footprint that can hold hundreds of cars, thereby reducing the risk of local area traffic issues. As you can see from the photo of the covered Cobb County Outdoor Arena in the bottom left corner of the slide, the vaccination operation is well protected from rain, allowing for continuation of the operation without interruption, even during inclement weather. Also, because the park is so large, it allows us to offer a mass testing site in one location of the park and mass vaccinations in another area with separate entrances and exits to avoid traffic issues between the two operations. Over the next several slides, I'll walk you through the flow of the operation at this site. Vehicles enter the large parking area as indicated near the top of the photo shown here and may wind around this large parking area several times depending on the volume of traffic that day before entering the smaller parking area indicated on the right side of the photo. The first contact with our on-site staff is at what we call the screener station where staff members ensure that individuals have an appointment and a completed consent form and provide them with the vaccine emergency use authorization fact sheet and some information about CDC's Be Safe monitoring system. 
With our recent ability to take walk-ups without appointments, staff at the screener station also help these walk-ups get registered. In addition, those without a completed consent form are provided with a blank form to complete. Because we had some challenges with people trying to get a vaccine without an appointment early on, and sometimes have traffic related issues near this location, we have law enforcement officers stationed here whenever possible. There's also easy access to the park exit in case someone needs to leave prior to vaccination. After leaving the screener station, vehicles are divided by a traffic control staff member into one of six lanes like those shown in the photo on the bottom left corner of the slide. The vehicles then advance down their respective lane until they reach the station shown in the photo on the bottom right corner of the slide, where a trained health educator will stop them until the vaccinators are ready. At this station, the health educator will discuss some basic logistical details about the vaccination process, confirm that the consent form is completed, and cover some basic vaccine-related information. Once the vaccinators are ready, they will signal for the next vehicle to advance to the vaccination station located adjacent to the tent shown in this slide. Inside the tents, clinical staff will be mixing and drawing up vaccines and preparing trays with alcohol swabs, vaccines, gauze, and band-aids for the vaccinators. The vaccinators will collect the consent forms, review them to ensure there are no contraindications to vaccination, and provide any counseling that may be necessary. The vaccinator then provides the consent form to administrative staff in the tents who complete the vaccine administration portion of the form and the vaccine record card while the vaccinator is administering the vaccine. The vaccinator then disposes of the used syringe and needle in a sharps container inside the tent and gives the completed vaccine record card to the client who is then ready to advance to the post-vaccination monitoring area immediately outside of the arena. This process at the vaccination station typically takes between two to five minutes depending on the team working in a given tent. The photo on the bottom of this slide shows the post-vaccination monitoring area where individuals are observed following vaccination. This area can hold approximately 40 cars and there is an overflow area that can be utilized if the main observation area becomes full. There are always EMT or paramedic trained staff available on site to manage individuals who might experience allergic reactions following vaccination if needed. We typically operate this site six hours a day, five days a week with a three hour operating period on Saturdays, vaccinating up to 1500 individuals in a six hour day. In Douglas County, we've been so grateful to Elm Creek Realty and Arbor Place Mall Management for allowing us to establish the county's only mass vaccination site as a similarly arranged drive through operation in the parking area of the former Sears at Arbor Place Mall in Douglasville, Georgia. The photo on the left side of the slide shows the area where cars enter and wind through the parking lot before arriving at one of the two lanes under the large tent shown in the photo on the right side of the slide. Depending on weather and volume, there are typically two or three vaccinators per lane at this site, and we use the interior of the Sears for storing supplies, mixing and drawing up vaccines, and handling administrative functions such as completing the vaccine record cards. This site operates during the same hours as our Cobb County site and can administer up to 1,000 vaccinations per six-hour day when operating at full capacity. In addition to our mass vaccination sites, our vaccine outreach team began holding vaccine outreach events in senior centers throughout Cobb and Douglas counties in late January, including the four shown on this slide. These events have been particularly rewarding because we have worked with the respective county senior services agencies to ensure that those we served were individuals 65 years of age and older who were otherwise unable to access vaccine appointments because of technological challenges. More recently, our outreach team has been working with partners such as the Wellstar Health Systems Congregational Health Network on vaccination events at a variety of different locations, such as houses of worship and community-based organizations throughout the district, including many of those shown on this slide. And lastly, I wish I had time to discuss our collaboration with all of these partners who have helped us throughout the vaccine rollout to date. Although support is not one of the four S's included in the National Research Council model used for framing our discussion today, we truly could not have overcome the many challenges we have faced throughout this pandemic without these partners and many others that wouldn't fit on this slide. This has been a team effort from the start and we will continue to require the support of these partnerships going forward. This slide shows the impact of our efforts with over 85,000 vaccinations administered across the district to date. Equally important, we have formed many new partnerships and strengthened many existing partnerships that will allow us to sustain our efforts going forward. I would like to acknowledge the support of the entire team at Cobb and Douglas Public Health and especially highlight the support I received from these individuals and groups with the development of this presentation. I could not have asked for a better team to work with. Thank you so much for your attention. That concludes my presentation and I would be happy to take any questions anyone may have at this time.
Thanks, David. This presentation is now open for questions. You can use the Q&A box to enter your questions. Um, I'm glad to hear that the roller coaster was not the only form of transportation uh, in the park for you guys. Uh, so that's oh, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, we're starting to get some questions that are coming in. Um, the first question is, uh, did asking for insurance cards or insurance information um, at the vaccination site uh, become a barrier? Um, did, it, did that become an issue for anyone if they didn't have insurance? Thank you for that question. Um, we ensured that was never a barrier by communicating um, to our community through a variety of sources, as well as to individuals at our um, vac mass vaccination sites that those without insurance um, would not be turned away and would not be charged any copay or um, any other charges there. And uh, really, it was just a, it was not a requirement to have an insurance card. Um, but we did emphasize to those who had insurance that um, providing that insurance to us and allowing us to, um, you know, to bill their, their insurance provider helped to fund our ongoing operations. Um, as you can imagine, this has been a, a really expensive endeavor. And so um, while we are not, um, you know, requiring any payments on site um, for any of our services, um, the ability to recoup um, payment from insurances um, ha has really made a big difference in our ability to continue to keep staff on and, and maintain our operations. Um, does this experience suggest any lessons uh, regarding building informatics or innovation capacity at local public health departments for future emergencies? Thank you for that question. I would say absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's been a, a certainly a lesson for us here that we, um, you know, w have already begun working on new systems and and even statewide. The um, the State Department of Public Health um, recently um, is has announced to us that they'll be um, releasing a new um, immunization registry system that um, will better interface with um, both C systems with CDC as well as with um, you know the local um, health districts as well. And so I, I think for me, the, the systems aspects of this rollout um, have really emphasized the critical importance of ensuring that we have systems that talk to one another well and that um, allow for very easy um, transfer of data. Uh, did you have any encounter or did you encounter any problems with vaccination card supply? Uh, we have not had any trouble at all. Um, the, in fact, we have a surplus of vaccine cards here. Um, the ancillary kits include enough um, cards for the number of uh, vaccines that are distributed. Um, and so um, because for the um, Moderna and um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines, uh, they require two doses and the majority of people um, you know, keep their cards um, after the first dose that uh, the cards that come in the, in the second ancillary kits for those second doses um, are essentially extras. And so, um, you know, we've been able to provide replacement cards when needed, um, and also, um, or if, if requested, folks um, may want a printout from the Georgia um, Immunization Registry as well, which some consider to be a, a more official um, source for that, those vaccine records rather than the cards uh, themselves. Um, have you been monitoring for health inequities in regard to access to testing and vaccine? Thank you so much for that question. So that's been something that has been really um, in the forefront of our minds throughout this pandemic. We, um, we've had a health equity committee that has included a number of partner um, groups and collaborators throughout the community for a long time, uh, but really never has it been more important than during this pandemic. And so um, we um, often, most of the time are meeting um, twice a month, but sometimes weekly um, for our health equity meetings to uh, try to better deploy resources to address any health inequities that we encounter in the community. And I think by pulling in a number of partner organizations that are trusted sources by um, you know, a variety of our groups in the, in the county, especially those who um, have experienced inequities, um, we're able to sort of better understand what's going on with um, those communities so that we can more nimbly deploy resources to address any health inequities. And I think um, you know, working, for instance, with our Wellstar Congregational Health Network um, has, has really had a huge impact on some of the both access and hesitancy issues for vaccinations that we've noticed and testing as well um, for individuals in our communities of color throughout the district. Um, you know, by holding these events at um, a house of worship where they regularly attend, 
Uh, it both provides them with confidence that um, this is being offered at a trusted location and um, supported and encouraged by trusted sources, including the leadership of their congregation, but it also uh, improves convenience for these individuals by placing it near to their home. And often the um, houses of worship can provide um, some limited transportation as well, or we can um, look for other ways as a, a team to provide transportation for folks to these events. So, Well, the majority of people who would go to a vaccine uh, distribution center or vaccine clinic is likely to uh, leaning to receiving the vaccine there that day. Um, but did any vaccinators encounter challenges with vaccine hesitancy on site? Um, and if so, what guidance was provided to vaccinators to address that hesitancy? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So um, we did often have a lot of questions on site. Um, you know, most of the folks that were coming to the site, you know, it was obviously it was their choice to be there. And so those individuals had chosen to be there um, and were, you know, interested in pursuing a vaccine, but many still did have questions or concerns about uh, receiving a vaccine ahead of time. And I, I think that's the uh, reason that we really, from the very beginning, wanted to focus heavily on the health educator position at our drive through events. These individuals would um, chat with the folks as they're coming in to get their vaccination before they reach the vaccination station. And those health educators would be trained um, routinely and given updates as well as we learn more about the vaccines so that they could provide um, information to answer questions that folks may have as they come in um, to receive their vaccine. And then also, um, you know, ensure that um, there weren't any additional concerns. And then of course our um, providers who are the clinicians that are actually administering the vaccines as they're going through the consent form, it offered an opportunity for them to provide additional counseling. And even after the first dose of the vaccine for those receiving a second dose, um, I spent many days working in the post-vaccination monitoring area. And that really offers a, you know, that 15 to 30 minute waiting period where um, they have me or someone else as a captive audience to ask whatever questions they may have. Um, and so that was a frequent place where we addressed questions or concerns that may come up um, either related to themselves or questions that may be um, asked by individuals who are in the car with those individuals who may not have received a vaccine that day. Who did you use as your health educators or how did you find health educators? Yeah, so these were... Um, generally just lay individuals who we trained um, upon hire. So they were, um, you know, we, we called them um, uh, essentially techs at our site, but they um, would fill the health educator role. Um, we also utilized um, our Air National Guard who um, have supported our efforts throughout the um, pandemic with both testing and at our mass vaccination sites. So a number of the Air National Guard um, individuals served in those um, health educator roles. And it was actually great having them there because many of them were medics um, who have some health experience. And it also received, a, they, many of them had also received a significant amount of training um, through their Air National Guard routine training about COVID um, testing and vaccinations. And so they actually were really a great source and um, you know one that has generally been trusted um, as well by the folks coming in for vaccination. Are you seeing a decline in utilization of the vaccination sites as the uh, vaccine availability increases nationwide? And along those same lines, have you begun to outline a tentative timeline for demobilization of your uh, testing and vaccination sites and call center? Yeah, we actually are on in ongoing discussions about that right now. And so we, um, I guess it's been a about two to three weeks now that we've started to notice the decline in demand for vaccines. Um, in our in both counties. And so um, we've already been discussing plans for demobilization and how we will ultimately bring the vaccination operation back into our um, typical uh, public health facilities. And um, that's actually been certainly welcome news to some of our partners who uh, we've been using their sites for these um, venues. But um, over the next several months, um, we are looking at timelines for demobilizing our, our mass vaccination operations um, at our Arbor Place Mall site um, because our um, the, the footprint for our physical buildings, um, public health department buildings in Douglas County um, are smaller. Um, we're actually discussing continuing to use the um, site at the, at the mall in the old Sears, but actually moving the operation indoors um, rather than having it um, as a drive-through operation. Um, but yes, those discussions about demobilization are ongoing and 
Um, and as we do that, we're also discussing um, ways to continue to ramp up our outreach um, activities so that we can ensure that we continue to serve individuals and improve access for vaccination throughout our health district. Um, the next question pertains with the terminology mass vaccination. Um, and uh, basically the question is asking um, whether there's a negative connotation with the use of mass vaccination. Apparently some health departments have been commenting that people will associate it with either mass shootings or mass disasters or the uh, terminology of the word mass may mean a large quantity of people in close proximity to each other, which is what we're trying to not necessarily have with COVID, um, and to try to use other terminology such as community vaccination clinic. Have you seen any, or do you have any opinions or anything about the terminology mass vaccination um, with your, your time? Thank you for that question. I, you know, that really hasn't come up here. We haven't really heard concerns about the use of that terminology in our health district. Um, so I don't know if that's just specific to our particular health district or not. I will say that, um, you know, I think people really appreciate, that's one of the things about the drive-through operation that I think people really appreciate. It actually offers an opportunity to keep people separated from one another in their vehicles so that um, it dramatically reduces any risk of exposure um, for individuals who are coming to the, the vaccination site, um, either while they're waiting to receive their vaccination or while they're in the post-vaccination monitoring area. And so I think, you know, as the word has gotten out about, about that particular aspect of our um, operation, it certainly has assuaged any concern that individuals may have had um, about a lot of people being congregated in a small area. Um. Before a vaccine supply became more widely available, it was reported that some patients after their first dose gave their second dose appointment cards to other people, such as family members, in order to get their first dose due to lack of uh, availability. Did you encounter anything or were there checks to um, prevent that kind of practice from happening? Yeah, that's a great question. So after our initial system problems with the very first system, we actually the, the second system that we, uh, appointment system we put in place actually um, allowed individuals to book um, their second dose appointment at the same time as their first dose appointment. Um, so, you know, that was with a name and birth date that was consistent with the information, you know, on the card as well as on their registration for their first dose. And so, um, you know, there were some checks in place and that was um, partially why, or one of the reasons we asked for ID was not only so that we could um, verify um, their, the information on the consent forms if they were handwritten, because sometimes it was difficult to read um, that information, but also it provided another check to ensure that, you know, we have the correct person who's got an appointment, who's registered, who received the first dose, that the timing of this second dose is the correct timing. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we haven't really had any reports at our sites of um, individuals from the same family um, giving their cards to individuals to get um, their first dose during their second dose appointment. Um, we did have a number of individuals um, of families who initially with our first system had actually signed up using just a last name. And so then um, because our list just had names listed on it, um, we didn't have a, with the initial system, a way to confirm, okay, so um, this is the Jackson family. Um, which of the Jackson family on the, you know, is, is this individual who's in the car? And so um, that was a problem which we then um, corrected with our um, additional systems by requiring, you know, first and last name and, and not allowing entry of multiple names into the, um, you know, into the, the name field. So we certainly saw, I've seen a lot of um, efforts early on of trying to game the system when supply was very limited, for sure, which was, um, you know, certainly a, a lesson for all of us. But. Well, thank you, uh, David, for all the answering your presentation and all of the question and answers and all the questions that were submitted by everyone. It's uh, three o'clock um, and that concludes the preventive medicine grand rounds and our, I'd like to thank our speakers and all of the great questions and all of our attendees. Our next preventive medicine grand rounds will be on Wednesday, June 2nd. Um, look forward to uh, seeing an announcement uh, about that. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for their, uh, their time and uh, attendance today.